right, all right, hustle fam, hustle fam. We are back with another amazing episode. And today I'm in uh, New Jersey, New Jersey. I'm with my friend, Mr. Anthony Gomez, the CEO and founder of Rapid Ships LLC. Anthony, welcome to Truck and Hustle, sir. Oh, Ramon, thank, thank you for having me here. I, I really appreciate you guys coming down and I'm excited. I'm happy to be on the podcast. Yeah, for sure, man. So, um, you know, thank you for the tour, taking us around. I've been, you know, checking everything out. Really amazing what you built in a pretty short amount of time. Um, you're 20, 26 years 26 old? 26 years old. 26 years old. You you have this warehouse here. You guys specialize in uh, cross-docking, warehousing, transloading, such and so forth. So we'll get into the story of Rapid Ships and how it began. Um, but first, let's kind of get into your background a little bit. Well, you know, let's establish it first. Tell everybody what Rapid Ships, Rapid Ships does as a company so they know what you guys do. So what we do as a company, we specialize in cross-docking, uh, pharmaceutical loads, dealing with high-ticket items such as medical supplies. We deal out with um, the retails on the distribution side. So we're essentially the middle facility before things go out. Um, we do a lot of airport pickups as well. We don't focus more on the trucking side, but our trucks are for our in-house customers. Um, we'll do a lot of pickups from EWR and JFK, and then we go and sort it back to our facility, then drop it off um, down south or wherever it needs to go. Um, we operate seven days a week. Essentially, we do have a 24-7 operation. So a lot of the trucks coming out from the West Coast, they come in here to the East Coast with about five to seven different loads. What they do is they call us, we then sort each of their uh, loads. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night or uh, one in the morning. We sort it and they go to um, the destinated uh, drop-offs and then they come back, pick up and it goes again. We focus more on short-term storage as well. So that's my niche. We found out that in order for us to continue to, to grow and be able to compete in such a... Uh, high uh, cash flow industry we we like things coming in and out that's what we focus on at the moment is got short it. term storage got it got it and you built this from the ground up um when when did you guys start what, how long you been in business so we've been in business since 2018 we officially got incorporated uh 2019 and we've grown ever since but we were able to really catch a breakthrough during the pandemic okay so before the pandemic came um, I started off, uh, I had an ex-partner who I would, he mentored me. Uh, he was the biggest freight forwarder to South Korea. So when COVID came, China got hit and then South Korea was the second country that got hit the hardest by COVID. So I saw that the people from the U.S. were shipping to South Korea hand sanitizers, gloves, um, Lysol wipes. And one day I saw a lady, she bought $100,000 worth of Puro hand sanitizer. And that same week, she made $400,000 mm. uh, shipping it overseas. And I knew the way things were going that they were going to shut the U.S. down. Before that, we started off as doing reconsolidation shipping in Colombia. So my family's from Colombia. So I try to replicate what he was doing in South Korea, meaning that in Colombia, they like to buy a lot of American brands. So Victoria's Secret, um, from Home Depot, DeWalt tools. But the issue is shipping to South America is very difficult um, and very expensive. If you're ordering from one store, you have to pay shipping from Victoria's Secret. And then you have to, if you buy from DeWalt, you have to pay shipping from DeWalt all individually. So what I wanted to replicate was instead of them having to pay separate shipping, they would ship it to the facility that I had in Palisades Park, New Jersey. And then we would consolidate everything into one box and save them about 70% of shipping to Colombia. And the issue that I saw with that business is that it's a very, uh, the margins were very thin and it's a very difficult business to maintain due to the economical standards in South America. So then when the pandemic came, I saw an opportunity. Um, they shut the country down and I tried to get my hand on nitrile exam gloves, uh, which I did. I was able to broker a lot of deals to the big hospitals, um, NYU, Boston Children's Hospital, um, and I built a lot of great relationships. And a lot of the people that I was able to meet, they were guys who dealt with the Bunzos, the WB Masons, the Walmarts. And essentially, they needed they needed uh, to find buyers, and I helped them find buyers. But then they became my friends, and they needed warehousing. 
And then I started off doing small warehousing jobs, eight pallets, five pallets, 10 pallets. With, they would bring it to my facility and then we would hold it. And I always told myself that it took me a while during the pandemic, it took me about six months to make $120. That was the first uh, money I ever made mm. was $120. Mm. I sold 12 cases of nitro exam gloves. And I think to me, that was the happiest day of my <laughs> life, essentially, because it it really, um, it was a sort of something special. Right. Uh, I was on the phone every day um, for 20 hours trying to find gloves and I was able to find it. And from there, I built off on that. It went from small cases to um, a truckload, then to containers. And then I would, now I was facilitating the containers that were being imported and exported. And then that's how I was able to really find success. Got it. Got it. All right. So um, that's, that's a ton to unwrap, uh, to, to unbundle, man. Ama amazing story. So what what is your background? Because, I mean, for you to – you talked about you had a mentor from South Korea, biggest freight forwarder in South Korea, but – Tell me about your background. You said your family's from Colombia. Correct. Did you were you born in Colombia? No, I was born in the uh, United States. Okay, you're born in the yep. U.S. All right, in Jersey. Yes, I was born in Inglewood, New Jersey. Okay, Inglewood. Yep. All right, got it. So you went to high school. Did you go to college? Yes, I I did go to college, uh, and then I ended up uh, dropping out. You ended up dropping yep. out of college. Okay, so after you drop out of college, what is your what is your path? What are you looking to do with yourself at that point? So. Just to, to bring us back, um, I used to play soccer. Okay. I was uh, I, I was pretty good. Okay. And um, I, at 17, I was already training with Toronto FC too. Okay. So getting ready to get go to the MLS. But then I was offered a uh, full scholarship to go to college. At that time, I was already playing um, with probably the best players in the country around um, my age. Um, I got called up to the U.S. Youth National Team pool. Um, I went to England to play at a Division Three team, and things were going. I felt good. I ended up going to North Carolina to play for Wilmington Hammerheads, which was a USL team. It's like the G League for the NBA. Mm. And then I, I thought I had a shot. And uh, during that time, uh, as I was, I decided to go to college for a year and then go overseas. But uh, my first day of college training, I felt a uh, pain in my hamstring. Mm. And it was weird. I thought I pulled the, I pulled my quad. I pulled my hamstring. Our first game was against Duke, um, which was a big school. Okay. I went to Iona, New York. What was, what was the school? I went to Iona University. Iona, okay. It's now Iona University, but Got it. I ended up going there. And um, my goal was just to get ready for that Duke game, and I didn't feel better. Two weeks went by, nothing. And then I ended up seeing the doctor. They said I had a, um, um, I needed to get hip surgery, meaning that... Um, my abductor was torn on both sides. Mm. So I ended up getting four surgeries. I had hip surgery as well as um, athletic pubalgia, which was- um, and, and you didn't know when this happened? No, no. The doctor just said that it's a rare condition that I had and I, from over time it was bound to happen and it just happened when I turned uh, 18. Okay, okay. And then that essentially, um, it, it was tough. It was tough on me because I worked my whole life to become a- professional soccer player that was my dream and it was very attainable um you were right there i was right there i was right across the finish line my friends were all getting uh, signed to big teams we were starting to get paid and i felt like i was questioning the man above why, why can't that be me you know and that was uh that was a painful time uh during my life got it got it all right so once you realize that you have to get these surgeries and they're basically saying you can't play again or is there like a path to recovery or what's going on? Yeah, so the doctor told me, he said that I would be able to play again, right? That he said I would be better than how I felt before, um, which uh, after the surgeries, I did feel good. I felt re really good, but I was already getting older. When that happened, I was 18. By the time I really fully recovered, I was about 20 years old. So there's, there's like a window there that you missed. There's like a window, yeah. So when you be, want to become a professional athlete, um, especially in soccer, if you if you want to make it to the next level and go to a big team in Europe or get signed, play overseas, the window is usually between 15 to 17. Mm. That's, that's the window. Unless you go to college and then get drafted and then go to the MLS and then you'll be 23, 24. But I knew that window, that was the window that we were supposed to hit and I, I couldn't. I couldn't make that window. 
Yeah. So at this point, you said you're about 20 years old. 20 years old. All right. And you, you see in your dream kind of like dwindle, like it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So obviously that crushed you. Um, so what, what, what will you do next? You know, um, I fell into some unforeseeable uh, circumstances. I ended up having to drop out of college. Um, I was studying to be a, a psychologist. Okay. So that was my major. My major was psychology. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to people, understanding how things work. But from there, when I saw that my career ended, it was coming to an end. It was very difficult for me to accept that. So then I just, I didn't feel like I had a purpose in life. Um, because the only way I identified myself was as an athlete, as a soccer player. So you would know me as Anthony, the soccer player. <laughs> yeah. that, that was my identity. Right. You know, and, and for you to identify yourself as something your whole life and then one day to not identify yourself as that, it, um, it crushed me. It really did. Yeah. And I didn't know what my next path was. So what I did was I, before any kind of business, I was a private soccer coach. So I, I would coach uh, uh, kids. That's my passion. Okay. Uh, I love uh, coaching. So I used to have about 10 kids that I would coach and train. Okay. And they all played for great academies. They were all younger, five-year-old, six years old, seven years old. And I would build off of that. So that's what I wanted to do. But I, I had so much pain from playing soccer and from the sense of feeling so down that I didn't even want to be involved with the game anymore. Mm. So right when I met my mentor, I used to train his son. Okay. And then I would always see him. He would always come. Very nice guy. Would always come. And um, I was I was 20 years old. I was very curious. He'd always have a, a nice car. A, a new car every day, <laughs> right. essentially. Right. So I said, man, what does this guy do? I need to ask him. I like to ask a lot of questions. So then one day he comes in. I'm training his son. We have a great relationship. I train him. I said, hey, um, what is it that you do? And he says, I do logistics. Let me show you. And then I worked with him for about a year. I just, I, no pay, no anything. I just learned the business hmm. for an entire year. Okay. And then I. Uh, and he was based in Jersey. He was as based well. in Jersey, yeah. Okay, got yeah. it. And then um, he was based in Jersey. And, and I, you say he was a freight forwarder. Freight forwarder, yeah. Got it. So just tell me what his, what, what, tell me about his business. A his bit. business is, uh, he's the biggest freight forwarder in South Korea. So he did essentially what I wanted to do in Colombia. Yeah. So the people from South Korea would buy um, in the U.S., they would ship it to his facility, and then he would charge for the shipping. So all his, all his um, freight would go in through planes. So he has a contract with the airline. Then from there, every Tuesday and Thursday, he would do deliveries to um, JFK Airport. And then he would deliver about eight pallets, nine pallets of freight that's going to South Korea. Got South it. Korea is a very uh, wealthy country. Got it. Making sure that your compliance is on point is an integral part of any trucking related business. Today, I stopped by my friends over at Fleet Drive 360 to talk about what they're building to make sure that you can run a successful trucking company. And it's everything from the minute you decide you want to hire somebody through maintaining all of your FMCSA compliance documents for ongoing fleet or, or owner operator truck uh, business. You've got a driver hiring and recruiting module where you'll create driver qualification files, import digital documents. You've got a drug and alcohol module where you can schedule pre-employment drug tests and manage an ongoing testing pool. We've got an accident registry so you can keep your mandated accident logs and even schedule follow-up uh, drug testing for post-crash. We've got vehicle maintenance logs so you can not only maintain the compliance status of your vehicles but also upload your work orders and compliance related documents so you're audit ready when they come in. We've got a document repository, fancy words for digital cloud storage of any document that you want, not just necessarily the compliance documents, anything related to your business, post-crash videos, performance evaluations. And then finally, you've got the dashboard. And the dashboard's the most important part. You can close your eyes and glance at our dashboard, open them, glance at the dashboard, and immediately know whether or not you're compliant or not, both on a driver, company, and vehicle level. It's one-stop shop for all your compliance needs. Now, when he took you under his wing, I mean, is he taking you to his office? Is he just talking to you? Like, how are you guys building this relationship for it, where he's mentoring you and teaching you about the industry? You know, so he would take me to his office and I would just see. Um, I think the first time I've seen a warehouse, it was his. It was about 3,000 square feet. Uh, 
I just saw pallets. I saw racks. I said, wow, this is so cool. I saw different kind of goods. And he just, he would just show me. I would take a lot of notes. I, I never, um, the kind of person that I am, I, I never asked for a handout. I never asked for any money or anything like that. And I would just look and analyze. And I learned a lot from him. And But not only learning from him, but I really start to find, I found a passion yeah. in logistics and warehousing. Something that really, that I really enjoyed was waking up, seeing how many pallets are going in, coming in, how many pallets are going out where where goods are being shipped from because a lot of people nowadays they don't know where the goods come from but i i do and it's it's very interesting and fascinating <laughs> yeah. you know and 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 i thought that was really cool and and um during that time uh i was still coaching i, I was gonna say time. at what point did you make up your mind to like because you're coaching his son yeah. and other people's kids right what point did you say all right you know what i'm about to pivot into this full time and really start taking it seriously so um during that time, I about six months in, I, I was working with, with kids. I was coaching, and then I had a, a part-time job as a coach as well. Okay. And um, it wasn't during the pandemic where I said, you know what? I'm going to take the risk. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving everything, and I'm going to – I have a passion in logistics. I think I could do something. The pandemic's here. The world's already shut down. I have nothing to lose. Yeah. I, at that age, I already felt like I lost it all. And I just said, hey, I'm, I'm going to take a leap. What does that look like? Because, I mean, during the pandemic, um, no, there's so much uncertainty. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows what tomorrow looks like at this point, right? So for you to start a new business, what gave you the, the, the courage and the, 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 the wherewithal to feel like I can be successful in doing this, knowing that nobody really knew anything about anything that was going on? So I think what what gave me the courage was um I reached the lowest point of my life and uh, I think the lowest point any human being possible could ever reach and when I reached that point um I asked I asked God I said you know what I'm going to do whatever I can to make it out of this and I have nothing else to lose but it was just my faith that I just believed that I could be somebody you know um when I would go to to present myself nobody knew who I was uh, in reality, a lot of people would shove me off. They would say, he's young. He doesn't know what he's doing. But I just kept going, yeah. you know, and, and I wasn't scared. I didn't have anything to lose. So so tell me about the first steps, right? So it's, it's 2020 now. I remember the pandemic vividly. It was uh, March or so, maybe 17th. 2020 when they made that announcement they were shutting everything down you start seeing all these people contracting COVID and you're like oh man what's going on so at what point in that do you start to take steps towards your new goal of getting into this space March 30th of uh 2020 I remember that day clearly um I was at my job at the time and um 10 days into the pandemic. 10 days into the pandemic I told everybody they're shutting the country down nobody believed me when they shut it down um they said, can't come back to work. I said, I'm out of here, guys. You know, and at that point, I said, this is this is my opportunity. Um, and I, I don't mean to say it in that sense because the pandemic was very difficult for a lot for of sure, people. For sure. You know, and but the way I look at things is that, you know, you get one opportunity in life where you either grab it or you don't. And I saw that and I, I, I ran with it. And at that point, March 30th, that's when I said, I'm all in. And that's all I wanted to focus on was my business and, and try to build it. I didn't know anything about, because the background that I come from, you know, I don't have anybody in my family who's a, a business owner. Um, I come from a very humble family. Um, and um, I didn't have any knowledge on how to build a business, how to start a business, what a business is. Um, and, and I just, I would do a lot of research every day. I would, I would work nonstop, um, Googling, reading books, and actually being being able to see what's going on. Yeah. You know? Now, at this point, had you already formed the business but not been... Because I think you said earlier, like around... You said 2019, you officially formed it. Correct. So as you were being mentored, you were you were kind of putting something together in your yeah. head. Yeah, yeah. But you were still working as a coach and so Correct. forth, right? Correct. Okay, got it. But 2020 is when you really go all in. Yes. And you start really developing what your business, is, what your business model is going to be. Correct. All right, got you. So tell me about how you get started, man. How does like the, what, like just cause we're here now. Like what was the first steps? Tell, tell me about that. Man, I always, um, I'm a big fan of Jeff Bezos. So I, I love what he's done with Amazon. 
Um, his main focus is customer service, how to please the customer. And I've and my main goal to start off and to this day is um, build relationships, talk to people, see what the problems are, find a solution. Because if there's a problem, there's always going to be a solution. So I started to to talk to a lot of people that I never actually, they were very um, successful people, you know, that I would come across because I was doing deals, I was talking, but they all took a liking to me. And and one thing about me, I'm I'm, I'm very uh I'm very honest. Some people would say I'm too honest, <laughs> you know, and that could get me in trouble sometimes. But yeah. um, I'm just very honest. I'm very loyal, and and I and I and I always want people to be happy, right? You know, so then. It, that's how it went Built good relationships um, But my big breakthrough um, That came about was During the pandemic yeah. It would go on And then that's that's how I switched my business over To warehousing domestically And But when the war ended in uh, Iraq do you, do you remember when the war ended in Iraq? Yeah um, When they brought the Afghan refugees over to the USA mm -hmm. So my company Um I was on LinkedIn a lot before LinkedIn became a really big platform. And yeah. I was on LinkedIn and I ended up reaching out to this guy to this day, very good friend of mine, very good customer of mine. Uh, I would send a lot, a lot of messages like, hello, I have a warehouse in New Jersey. Um, I would love to help you with your services. We're reliable. And um, I send that over three months later, he sends me a message saying, hey, I've, we have um, the Afghan refugees over uh, that are being brought over to New Jersey. Can you handle the distribution for them? Mind you, at this point, in my head, I'm I'm thinking, oh, this is this is a great opportunity, but at the same time, it's too good to be true. Right. You know, it's too good to be true. Yeah. Um, and he said, yeah, we have to deliver to the base. We have to sort all of the packages. And I said, all right, we can do it. Um, I think the most important thing when you're starting off a business is you have to be willing. You have to say yes, <laughs> right? But as you grow and as you get um, more, you have to be willing to say no to certain things mm. but I said yes even if I thought I couldn't do it I would say yes and the next week we had multiple packages arriving and pallets on top of pallets and then from there we were sorting to the base to Fort McGuire in Trenton we did that for seven months we delivered all the medical supplies we did all the distribution and um, that was our first big customer big break wow just off a of LinkedIn outreach just, just off a of LinkedIn outreach that's crazy. All right, so because I'm just trying to put the 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 the, the build up in perspective. So you said you said earlier you were saying how you were just like, like building relationships with a lot of powerful people, right? Like those calls that you were making, what what were you what were you selling to them or what were you talking about at that time? It, 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 when did you get the warehouse? When did that come into place? The warehouse came into place with um with my ex partner. Okay. Um, we would share the same building. That. That's, that's how, the palace we were talking Yeah, that's the palace. Jumping. That's the palace. Moving, guys. <laughs> that's the palace. We're in a warehouse right now. <laughs> right, right, right. So, okay. Okay. So, your ex-partner. Yeah. So, at what point in the process did you partner up oh. and then become, y'all dissolve that and then you, because oh. I'm trying to get to the point to where you have the warehouse and have the facility. You know what I mean? Because we're kind of like moving past that. Yeah. So, just kind of oh, go man. to the build up a little bit. So, um, my ex-partner, the name, his name was Key. Key. Okay. Um, Key. Highly respect him, great man, you know. Um, so um, we we partnered up. He 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 said, "Hey, he this is really like soccer coach. Right? After soccer coaching, yeah. okay." He said, "Look, and where you where you where you know him from? Just around? Uh, yeah, he used to go to um, I used to coach the Korean church in New Jersey, and he he would go to church okay. all the time. Got so you. that's how. But, we but met. this is is this the freight forwarder? It's freight forwarder. Okay, freight so forwarder. he was your ex partner. Yeah, yeah. Got yeah. it. All right, because I know he's your mentor, but I didn't know he was your ex partner. Yeah, yeah. He was too. my ex partner. Actually. All right, so you guys get in the business together. Yeah, now, more than a mentor. More than a mentor. Go ahead. I'm, I'm. He always uh, he he would always say there's something special in you because he would see how hard I work uh, every single day. How how I would always find a way to get things done. Yeah. And then during the pandemic, I said, you know, uh, that's when I started building relationships. Yeah. And we started using his warehouse. He said, come on board. And then we didn't, he never was a part of Rapid Ships. We were using another company called We Global. Mm -hmm. And then that's how we formed. So with him, it was, uh, he didn't put any money into the business. It was all me. So whatever the money that I earned, I would just use it because at the time, I didn't know anything about business. I didn't have credit. I didn't understand partnerships, agreements. So we would buy everything we bought 
the two trucks under his company's name, mm -hmm. which um, me and him, we were partners, but we never had signed documents, agreements. Gotcha. Handshake. Handshakes. Handshake. Which I'm I don't advise anybody to do, by the way. Absolutely but. not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then it was a handshake. Everything was off a handshake. When we shook hands, that's when we went out, got the two trucks from the money that I've built. And then um, that's how we got um, the trucks for the distribution to the Af uh, Afghan base in Fort McGuire. Okay. And then from there, as the pandemic started to kick off, um, we, 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 were, we were moving a lot of freight, a lot of COVID test kits. So um, in those trucks that you in those bought. trucks, yeah. Okay, gotcha. That, that we bought the straight trucks that outside, trucks. the same ones that no, was, no, 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 no. This one, no, okay, different ones. Okay, gotcha. They were brand new. We got them. Um, so then we were hauling COVID test kits at the time. They were worth about a million dollars a, a truckload, mm -hmm. or about five hundred thousand dollars. And how did the, that opportunity come come about? The COVID test kits with the relationships that I built brokering out. Um, okay. During the pandemic. Okay. So a lot of the guys who were actually supplying all the COVID test kits for eye health. Um, Genobio, they were very, I did deals with them, but then I would always stay in touch with them. And um, I was always able to bring deals to the table. So it's not like I was one of those guys that was um, telling people that we were going to make $200 million because during the time of the pandemic, they were called unicorn lots. So somebody would message you and say, we have 200 million boxes of gloves in a warehouse in Los Angeles, California, which as you all know, that's a lot of trucks and a lot of warehouse space and it's not possible. Right. But at the time, Everybody was believing it. So y you would spend time on the phone with six, seven different people. Everybody saying, hey, I need this commission split. I need this. I need that. But my focus was that I always knew that the pandemic was going to be finished. Gloves were going to go back to normal. Everything was going to go back to normal. I wanted to build off my warehousing distribution. So through off every deal, I would say that we had the warehousing. So then that's how it came about. You were leveraging the leveraging. warehousing. Yeah. Got you. So that's how you were able to get people to have conversations with Correct. you. Correct. And where were you finding these people to connect with to do these deals? It was with? off uh, WhatsApp. WhatsApp group chats. WhatsApp group chats. WhatsApp group chats. Yeah. It's um. But how? Did how I... did I get into the group chats? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it was just like um. <sighs> it was a lot of digging online. Okay. I I I really don't recall because it's been so long. Yeah, now. so long. But it's like you just but ended I up in these group chats. Ended up in these group chats with people from overseas. Overseas. Who have these COVID test kits. COVID test kits. And then you were able to say, hey, I, I want to purchase this amount of tests. Well, uh, well, you want to broker a deal yeah. between someone here who needs yep. them and them. Yep. Okay. My, um, what's funny this is. is interesting, man. I'm, go ahead. I'm listening. My first customer, I, I don't know if you guys know him, Gary V. You know Gary V? I think I've heard of Gary, Gary v. v before. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, yeah. Yeah, this is actually, um, they were actually my first customer. So, Gary V? Gary V. Well, Vayner, so, Vayner, Vayner Media. Vayner, Vayner, Media? Vayner, Vayner Media was actually my first customer. We are here live at OTR Solutions HQ. I'm here with my partner, Jonathan. Man, listen, factoring is an integral part of the transportation industry. Why is factoring important? Absolutely, Ramel. In this economy, in this market, cash flow is king. Cash flow is the key to growth. If you have a young trucking company, or if you've been in the industry for years and you want to take that business to the next level, we're absolutely a company that can help. So I hope you'll give us a call today. Let us know what we can do to help you out. Get the rest and roll with the best. Let's go. This was my, after I made the $120. Yeah. I reached out to Viner Media. Uh, I believe it was off Twitter. Might have been off Twitter. <laughs> I, I, you yeah, find I, people like the crazy. Yeah, this is like a testament to like just doing the simple things, man. I was I, hung, I was hungry. One way or another, I was going to find a way. Go ahead. Tell the story. Um, so I reached out to, I tweet Gary V. I'm like, Gary V, um, I want to help you get some masks. Do you need some masks? Like, because he he posted a tweet about um that he needed medical mask. Man, I jumped on it. I reached out. And then he says, yeah, my, my assistant Lou is going to message you. Shoot, Gary V. You know, I've been looking at his motivational videos. I, you know, right. I get in touch with Lou, and then he ends up, yeah, it's going to a hospital in New York. Uh, they're donating them. They bought four thousand masks, um, and I ended up getting them from China. Uh, I found a good supplier. We ended up supplying it to them within a week, a week and a half. But the freight was ridiculous, um, and they paid. I, I, I only made like three hundred dollars, but that off of it right, right? starting off $300 right. that's a lot of money but it, it 
it gave me the opportunity and the motivation. Right. And to it say was this like, could, I could do this. I could do this. I said, Gary, you know, boom, I could do this. And then that that was my first customer. So when you when you're working with uh you know, these suppliers and stuff overseas, how do you, how do you vet like number one, the supplier? How do you vet like making sure the pro the actual product is like, cause at that time mass, like there was like the N95 yeah. mass. How did you know they, they worked and all that? They so, were the right mass. Like so, <laughs> so you touch on a great topic. I didn't, I, I it, it wasn't like the, the knowledge that I have today is completely different than what I had before. Yeah. I, I just did my research the best that I could. It was K95's mask, but at the time there was a lot of counterfeit. Uh, a lot of fake 3M, 3M masks uh, that were being uh, shipped into the country. A lot of fake nitro exam gloves. Now I, I know the difference between what's real or not right. with a lot of products. Um, but at the time, I didn't. I just did my research. I followed the spec sheets. Vetting the supply was very difficult because there's so many fraud. There's so much fraud. You have to pay money up front. And at the time, it, it's $4,000 and it's not my money. You know, if I lose it, it's bad rep. I, and, and luckily... I, um, I, I got a good supplier. I did my research and then we were able to get the mask. Yeah. And yeah. then that's how it came about. Got it. So that was the first. Have, have you ever had a, a situation where somebody tried to fraud you? Yeah. Does yeah. that happen um, often? Like, or is it like a one off type of thing? You know, there's been, even in today's world, there's, there's suppliers that say they have this product and then they really don't. Yeah. So then they, hey, send the deposit, send this. And, but now it's, it's, t I'm 10 steps ahead of every kind of precaution. Gotcha. Um, you have a process in place yeah, yeah. to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. Yeah. <laughs> but before any money gets sent out or we buy any product, we have to physically inspect. I have to see the goods if we're buying any product. Mm. Because you can buy, uh, let's say, 10,000 pairs of shoes from China or from wherever you may buy. They can ship 5,000 on the container and the other 5,000 boxes are empty because that, that has happened before. Yeah. I've seen it happen. Yeah. And it's it's scary. It's <laughs> for sure, for sure. All right, cool. So you have this big break with Gary V and now like you say you made three hundred dollars, but now you know you have something. So continue the story. Tell, tell me how things continue to develop. So then um you know, my my parents, I come from a traditional background, so my parents, my mom, my dad, everybody was like, son son, just 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 study, um, find a different route, like you know, they were very worried about me because I was working 20, 20, 21 hours a day on the phone trying to close deals. And then I was continuing. I was growing. Right. And um, they didn't know what they didn't know what was to come. You know, a lot of the times in my background, my culture, it's you have to go to school. Taking risk is, is very dangerous. So you want to find stability. And um, to me, it was just like we got Gary out the way. I, I spoke about that to everybody for for a week or two. I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, man, I just did this. Can yeah, you believe it? Everybody was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Keep, keep going. And then from there, it was just like more deals, you know. Um, then now, I, are you still with your partner at this point? No, no. no. Okay. That, that was a relationship that is long gone. Got it. Um, why did you decide to dissolve that relationship, if, if you don't mind sharing? I'll tell you exactly why. Um he was a much older man, much more successful. He had about three, four businesses. He was already successful to the sense. He was already a millionaire, already has done a lot. And I was young. I was hungry. And I had more desire, more ambition to keep growing. So what I wanted to do. But then it also came to the sense where I was putting in the work every single day, multiple hours. I was bringing in all the funds, all the customers. Um, and he was taking half of my profit. Mm. Um, you know, and 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 for somebody to take half of something they don't deserve, they don't put the work in, and I was being taken advantage of. He saw yeah. that I was young, didn't know what I was doing, and then said, "Hey, let me get him." So every month he was getting his cut, and I I didn't question it. He didn't put any money into the business besides me using a warehouse at the beginning. Yeah, and and I I noticed that. You know, I said, you know what, this was um. This was after closing all the deals and, and I, I had a steady customer base with great relationships. He never dealt with any of my customers. It was always me. That's when we had a... Um, then another, another contract that we got was with uh, Vineyard Vines. You yep. know Vineyard Vines? Very familiar with them. Yeah, so um, we actually did the distribution three days a week out of Monroe Township into uh, New York. Okay. Brooklyn, New York. So we did that three days a week. We'd ship about 90 boxes because we have cargo vans. So that's what we would do. Yeah. So we'd pick up from Monroe Township and deliver it to New York. So they had a little distribution hub. So that was a great contract that we had. And um, 
my contract actually ended with them because my partner, my ex partner at the time, sent out an email saying that I was just an employee at the company, and then that that sort of damaged the image. So mm-hmm. then we stopped working with them. But um, once he was done, why? why? What was the point? What was the purpose of that email? I think, I think truthfully, you know, you go off handshake, you believe people's words, but I think the biggest fact is once money's involved, things always get messy. Mm. You know, uh, and the day I told him that I was leaving, uh, I didn't want to be in this no more. Um, I really appreciated him. I take my half. You take his share. He said, no, you have to stay with me. Mm. The reason why he wanted me to stay with him was because. You was a cash cow. Yeah, he was cash cow. Exactly. <laughs> he was milking me in, until no more. Yeah. You know, and, and I think um, people who, who come into business, they don't have any idea on business. They're, su- they're very uh, gullible, susceptible, you know. Uh, you you see things much differently because you believe you trust everybody you believe everyone but the more i got into businesses the more you don't trust no one everybody is here to 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 get what's theirs right you know and you have to protect what you've built um so when that happened we ended up splitting um i ended up moving down here to east brunswick i moved into a smaller location over at 40c and then from there, I stayed about eight, nine months. And then I realized I was out of space. I mm. only had 5,000 square foot. Got it. So Did you now, lease the space? Th- what happened? You the yes, space. Yes, yes, lease okay. the space. Got it. And then here we are today at 25A Carter's Lane. Um, three docks, uh, about 900 to 1,000 pallet space if it's double stacked. And we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. So once you... And and you said like once you you and your partner split up, you really had all the relationships anyway, so it didn't yeah. really impact you that much, like in terms of the split, right? Because yeah. you just kept on really going with what you were already kind of building, exactly, right? Um, and when do you start like kind of forming what your business is going to be? Because like you said, you focus on like medical, right? You 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 have a niche. Correct. So how did you come into that? I mean, obviously, I know the COVID stuff like that was maybe like a a. a uh, uh, a light bulb moment like understanding like those needs but what made you want to focus because you could do all types of fulfillment yeah. right what made you want to focus in that space just tell me about how you started to build your business um after you split from your partner so one thing that i realized in the trucking industry or in the warehousing industry is that when it comes to trucking right there's always going to be guys that can go rent a u-haul and deliver your freight for a hundred dollars there's always going to be guys that are willing to 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 bid on a job and lose money just to get the job. So my, my dream was always to get a bunch of trucks and to be the next uh, um, trucking, next large trucking company. Like J.B. Hunt or J. something J.B. Hunt, like XPO have 2,500 trucks. Yeah. It, to me, that's, that's not the goal because I've been in the industry for a while and I've seen that it's very, 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 very difficult because there's always guys that are going to try to undercut you and... The kind of freight that they deal with, if, for example, if you're shipping water bottles, empty water bottles, you're not going to pay as much as if you're shipping um, uh, medical supplies or pharmaceuticals. So I got it into my head that we deal with high ticket valued items, which is, uh, to me, it, it's that's just my niche. I like to deal with medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, because they're more valuable and customers are they're more worried about making sure their goods are protected, the goods are picked up, delivered on time by a reputable company, instead of paying for the cheapest. Mm. Was there a moment that that made you realize that, or was it just kind of like you just thought thought it through? It was just thinking it through, just seeing how um, the kind of customers that we were dealing with, what some were paying and what others weren't. That's how I was able to to pinpoint things together. So at one point you were doing a variety, variety of things, yeah. Uh, I remember the first job I ever did trucking wise was uh um I I did five deliveries in Queens for three hundred dollars. You did them. I, I did them myself. Yourself. I ne- I never drove a box truck before, but I, I went out, I was in Queens for five for fourteen hours because yeah. my phone died. I had no GPS. <laughs> uh, you have to use trucker's path, you have to use a special GPS. You yeah. don't want to go on the bridges. I did it myself and Three hundred dollars. I think I lost about six hundred dollars with time, fuel, and everything. So I ended right. up losing. But that was my first ever trucking job. But then I was able to see, okay, this is what you have to charge. I didn't know what I had to charge in order to be profitable. I didn't know what kind of routes I had to take, what I had to do in order to to build a su- successful business. Mm. But the way I see it is, you have to try. 
you try and then you get it right. You might lose some money on the way. You might you might work more hours because, or you might have to redo things twice, but you'll learn a lot more. So when, when did you start doing the, the, the trucking aspect of it? Because you were, you were doing warehousing yeah. primarily, right? And that, f- that fulfillment piece. But when did you start even doing out and going doing deliveries? Uh, during all? during the that time with the contract that we got here in New Jersey. Got it. Now you have the trucks. Now we have the trucks. But before the trucks, my ex-partner had one truck. It was a Hino box truck. It was used. He would only use them for the airport deliveries. And he said, Anthony, you go and uh, you go and I said, hey, we should get into the trucking business. He didn't believe me. <laughs> but then I started to, to get my customers. And then um, that's how it started with that one truck that I was able to use. Okay. And then you go out there and, and do it yourself. Yep. And start building the business. All right. And you have you pulled back from doing that or you, do you still no, do it? No. To this day. Trucking um, a bit. We still do trucking. Okay. We, we still do a lot of airport pickups from JFK, EWR. Okay. okay. Um, but it's more concentrated to the sense we're not bidding off the load board. These are my in-house customers. Got it. Um, to us, our focus is warehousing. Got it. And then keeping our customers happy, making sure that they're happy on the warehousing side, and then they'll give us their freight if we okay. do a good job. Got it. Okay. How were you able to then build these relationships with like the airport and so forth? Is, is that something that was difficult for you to do, or was it as simple as a, another LinkedIn post or <sighs> another WhatsApp message? <laughs> no, no. It was... um. <laughs> One thing about me is that I like to analyze everything. So when I would go into these different facilities and locations, um, I would just look. I would ask questions. Hey, what freight is this? I look at the freight, where it's coming from. And I would reach out directly to those people that were shipping the freight. And then they would say, hey, yes. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a businessman and 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 I want to make sure we do the right thing, what's good for the company. So I know there's a lot of competition out there, but... If we can provide a better service, offer better value, we'll go and pursue the same business. Um, but at the same time, it's a um, it's a big enough industry where everyone you don't have to go after everyone else's customers. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So basically, you just paying attention to what's around yeah, you. Yeah, every time. <laughs> I'll go into um, I'll go grocery shopping out, or I'll go to the store, a small store. I'll ask him, hey, where do you get this from? I'm always asking questions, even when I'm not working. I'm working. Mm. I'm trying to see what. Who, what my next customer will be? What are they doing? If I'm in New York, if I'm traveling, I'm always asking questions. Where's this trailer coming from? Where is he heading? I like to see what are they, um, what drivers are being paid? What are the warehouse workers being paid? A lot of the times, it's like I'll go in disguise. <laughs> I'll go drop off stuff myself to go see. Okay, um, I'll ask the employees because I like to always see: Are we being competitive with my people? Mm. Am I taking care of my people? Yeah. Which I, I feel like that's a foundation of a business, being able to, to take care of your people in the right way. Yeah. So and I, I like to ask questions. Okay, you drop off the freight or just in general. I don't I don't dress all dress up every single day it's just for the interview. I'm always I like to be with my guys, I like to see what's going on, and then I like to be in the in the office as well. Because I feel like as a leader, in order for you to get things done right, for you to want your people to get things done right, you have to be a leader and show them what to do. Yeah, I think I could I could probably drive a forklift better than a lot of the guys working in a warehouse, <laughs> you know. And and it's um, or I can probably offload and make pallets better. Yeah. But the reason being is because I want to make sure if I tell my guys that something needs to get done in X amount of time, I know that it's possible. Mm. You know, Got if you it. look at a a lot of the big CEOs from big companies, a lot of, a lot of these guys then they've never been in the field with their employees. They don't know what it's like to drive a truck. To be in a warehouse, to repack, to palletize, to offload. They don't know that. They just see, analyze things from numbers as well. And and that could work for them, which I'm sure it does. Yeah. But I think um, you have to care about what you do. And now a quick payroll Q&A segment by our sponsor, Roll by ADP. All right. So we are here with Mr. Anthony Gomez from Rapid Ships LLC. Uh, Anthony, I got a few questions to ask you, man, about uh, about payroll and just, you know, employment and so forth and so on. Tell us about hiring your first employee. What do you wish you knew now that you didn't know then? The process of, of the hiring process, uh, payroll, how to pay them. Um, what's the difference between a 1099 employee and a W-2 employee? When you hear the word payroll, what is your first initial reaction? Taxes. <laughs> what features in an app would make the payroll process easy and seamless for you and your company? One of the issues that we have is that um, we have to use a different app to clock in the employees. Okay. But if the payroll offered that, 
internally it'd be what's much connected easier. it's connected and it yeah. can be automated could be through that whole process yeah. you'd be good to go yeah all right good deal well teenage fam if you know how to send a text you know how to run payroll having a solution that can easily walk you and your employees through payroll submissions with ease is essential roll by adp is your very own payroll assistant roll learns the ins and outs of your business to manage payroll effortlessly so you can put your focus where you want it as a payroll app, Roll provides payday alerts, timeline to-dos, and AI-driven error checks. Roll has your back. And Truck and Hustle listeners get their first three months free. And after that, pay only $24 a month plus $5 each employee. Visit RollByADP.com slash Truck and Hustle. 100%. What, what does it take to operate a warehouse? Talk about this space and then everything that it takes from your from your pallet spaces, your shelves, from your forklift, like what does that look like to just get people to get a perspective of what it looks like to operate a warehousing operation? The most important thing for you to even have a warehouse is to have the right personnel, to have the right team around you. Um, and then safety procedures, making sure that they have all the right equipment to be successful, such as a forklift, pallet jack, uh, safety vest, hard hats, gloves, knives, um, shrink wrap, and just making sure that whatever your guidelines are as a company, they're able to follow. Because it starts from the personnel. When I first started off, it was I didn't have the right people, so I would have to work three times as hard. Now with having the right people, my customers are happy. We're able to get we're more productive at getting shipments outbound and inbound, and and it's it's much better. But to operate a warehouse, you really have to be there on top. You have to make sure that you know what's coming in, what's going out every single time. Mm, got it. So it starts with the personnel, which makes sense. It's always about people. What about your, what are like your fixed costs? What are the things that you have to spend money on consistently? And what are the, what are the costs that like kind of fluctuate? Rent, rent. Uh, we lease, so we have to pay rent every month. Yeah. Uh, the forklift. You lease that as well? Yeah, we lease okay. that as well. Got it. Pay forklift, uh, payroll. The lights, utilities, garbage, cleaning up, landscaping, um, a lot of uh, miscellaneous expenses as well that come into that. Let's say um, about three weeks ago, a driver backed into the dock. He took the uh, one of the dock plates off, the bumpers. That has to get welded back on, which is another expense. Yeah. Um, so some weeks, some months, things are steady, fixed, and some, some months... It isn't. They vary. It varies. When, when you and, and when you're pricing, are you taking all these things into consideration? Like how how long did it get to? How long did it take for you to figure out a pricing model for? And, and how do you price it? You price it by space, pallet. Like how many pallets? Like give us an idea what that sound, what that looks like. Okay, so um, I'll give you an example. Yep. Um, I have customers. They'll call me, uh, in and out fee. So that's what pallets, that's the fee that you charge to bring the pallet off the truck and pallet onto the truck. I have customers who will call me and the first thing they'll say is, you know what, this is not your right price. I have people that do it for $6 an hour. And I tell them, I said, you have people that do it $6 an hour, go. They never go. <laughs> because we're the only facility that's able to ever be very flexible with the customers at the time frame that they need to offload. A lot of the times, the pricing model when I started off, I had no idea how to price I was, I'm sure I was underpricing. I, I was doing things for free, essentially. Yeah. But now, as you get into time, one thing that I like to do as well is I like to call other warehouses, other companies. Hey, as a customer, what are you charging per pallet? If I have a container coming in, they'll give me their rates. I'll get five, six different rates, and I'll see, okay, we're, we're at market, or we're a little too high, or we're just right, or we're under. We're undercharging. Mm. I think that's one of the key factors to do is whatever business that you're in is that you have to be... You have to always see what the other people are doing, what pricing wise. So then that way, you know what to charge. Yeah. So then when it comes to charging now, one thing that before I used to be very flexible. So certain customers would call me and then uh, they would try to talk to me. Hey, come on, give me a discount, you know. <laughs> but the more we grow, the more I understand that every dollar counts. Every penny counts. I don't give, I can't give discounts. Yeah. You know, and um that that's our price is our price if you have an issue then you take it up from there but a lot of the times we're so flexible that customers are always going to come back got it what is your uh how do you 
how do you project? Like, how do you project for the future? How are you looking to scale this operation? Do you want to get into a bigger facility? Kind of talk about that, like your goals for next year and like the next three to five years for Rapid. Goals uh, for next year, we want to continue to scale, get into a bigger facility, focus on our existing customers. So then because the more they grow, the more we grow, the more space they'll need. And I think that's very important. The customers that we have right now, very loyal. We have about a 99% retention rate. So the first customers that use us, they always come back. Oh, wow. Same customers you see in my facility, they have been with me from the start, from when we had very little to now. What so, do you think is the, is, is the reason for that? You know what? I, I genuinely think it's the fact that the personal relationship where they know where their goods are, they know who they're speaking to. Yes, they can speak to my team, but if anything, they can always call me. My, my direct number is always available for my customers. Obviously, it becomes a little bit harder the more you grow, you know, but I, I just feel like the most important thing is to pick up the phone when, when you get a call. Yeah. How do you get the word out about your services and, and, and what you offer? Is this a word of mouth type of business or are you doing a lot of sales? No, for us, it's just been word of mouth. Um, we focus a lot on LinkedIn. We've never done any paid ads or social media, Instagram, none of that. It's just been word of mouth referrals from our existing customers to our new customers. Mm, got it. That's a great way to grow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um. You know, some days I think, wow, can we get more business if we focus on the sales side? But the way I see it is I'm always selling the company. So it's it's like I'm always searching for new customers as well. Yeah. Um, and as we grow, I do want to expand on the sales side as what, well. What's the most difficult uh, part about this business? It's just the demand, the, the hours. Um, because truthfully, if you see these other big warehouses, they work from nine to four. They have their set hours, but these are companies that, and I and I'm speaking respectfully. These are companies that have had investors, have been dumped a lot of cash into it. So in this kind of business, it's if you have a lot of cash to play with, it's going to be very easy for you to grow, mm -hmm. right? A company like mine, we're bootstrapped all the way up. No, no investors, no private loans. We're every single month we're we're pushing, and um. I do aspire to be like one of these large companies, but I know it's going to take time. And But that's that's what they do. They have their own investors, and then that's how they're able to continue to scale. But for us to scale, we have to continue to focus on our customers and and push on growth on that side. Yeah. How, how long do you think it will be before you're ready to grow into a, a bigger space? Projected maybe within the next year. Okay. Got it. Will you stay within this same area, just like grow within this space, or would you look for another location? Like, how important is location for you? It, location is the most important thing in this business. The closer you are to the port, it makes a big difference. So, if, example, if I wanted to put a warehouse in Manhattan, it would not be as effective as it would be here because of the location wise. Right. Um, you have trucks that are always coming down south. The location is the number one thing. Even though at a, at a different location, rent could be cheaper. But if the location is not good, it's 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 gonna do more damage than good. That's also a selling point for you. Yeah. Like where you're where you're kind of located. Where we're located, close to the port, um, close to PA, Philly, um, I ninety five is right here, and trucks are able to get in and out fast. Got it. What type of margins does a warehouse business see? Whatever you could speak to, whatever you could share, like in terms of the, on the financial side. Ten to thirty percent margins. Okay. And why the range? What is what is the variables that that make the range from ten to thirty? Depending what kind of projects that you have. Okay. So, you have certain projects that you know are going to bring X amount, or there's other projects that bring in much larger margins, much larger uh, uh, amounts. Got it. So depending on the project, yeah, yeah. And, and the and the customers and so forth and so on. Got it. So aside from the medical. Um, so everything in here is all medical right now for the most part? All medical and uh, some ovens as well. <laughs> some ovens. For some ovens. Yeah. Well, how, how did that come about? Ovens. Because uh, that, that's kind of off. Uh, these are ovens for um, restaurants. Okay. Uh, it's, it's just a customer of mine and they import ovens. Okay. They're, they're big on that side. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right, cool, cool, cool. All right, I think we uh, we we covered a lot of 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 the business portion. Just um, for you personally, I, I just want to have some just because because you're a young guy, man. You're 26 years old. 
how do you continue to, you know, personal development? What do you do to keep yourself, your mind sharp, you know, keep yourself um, going, keep yourself encouraged? Just like entre- on a, from an entrepreneurial aspect, what keeps you motivated? I like to uh, I like to pray a lot. Um, I'm Christian, so I like to um, to read the Bible. I like to pray a lot. I like to spend a lot of time with my family. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Um, I, I love to play soccer on the weekends, uh, but generally, I love to work. Uh, I'm a workaholic, yeah. so I, I love to work, but I like to read. I haven't been reading as much lately, but um, I like to work out as well. Okay. I think it's important to, and I like to see other entrepreneurs to learn from them, yeah. what are their habits. What is it? Do you have like a monetary goal? Uh, like, what is your thoughts around money? You know, um, I, I didn't come from a lot of money. And um, I, I just think that money really doesn't bring you a lot of happiness. The more money you have, the more responsibility, the more stress. Um, that that That's what I think. But I, I respect money. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. Got it. So you're not motivated by the money? No. No, I'm just... My motivation comes from being, I want I want to reach the pinnacle of success. I yeah. want to be the best entrepreneur that I could be, the best businessman. And my motivation isn't money. Got it. Got it. Talk to me about your your team because we were we kind of interacted with some of your team today. How many people are on your team, and 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 what does that what does that look like? I have five guys that are on my team, and um, they're just great. Uh, different what's, what's personalities. Their roles? Talk, talk about the uh, warehouse drivers, yep. um, but mostly warehouse labor as well. We have Chloe. She's our director of operations. Um, I think that uh, my team is young, so it's a lot of young young guys on the team. Yeah. But is that great. intentional? No, no, it's not. Okay. It's not. It's just, just it's happen just, that way. Yeah, yeah. It's just the it's just the energy. You know, I'm the kind of boss where I'm like, hey, how's your day? How's your family? Everyone's good. I like to. I always like to, to see how my people are doing first. Yeah. Even if my customers call me or interaction, the first thing I will ask them, how's your family? How's your day going? Before we even get into business. Yeah. Because I think that's very important. Has has being young ever been a handicap for you? Yeah. I think um, people will see me and try to take advantage. It's feel like he, he doesn't know uh, business or he, he's young. But it's right now, It's not. that's not the case anymore. Yeah. They... um. They respect you. Yeah. What yeah. about what about in your role as like being a, a, a boss of other young people? Like, do you ever have challenges to where it's like they look at you as like a peer because you're so young? Yes. And those guys, they don't last here that long because the respect is a difference of respect. You know, um, that does make a lot of sense because sometimes if I want to hire someone, they're either a little bit older than me or, or younger, but it comes from a sense of respect. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, if I'm the owner or the boss, then we we still have to have that line of respect. Got it. What what is a what is a culture here at Rapid, and how how much did, have you how intentional are you about about culture and things like that? Culture is family. Everybody here is family. We treat each other like family. Um, that's the culture here: family, respect, honesty, and integrity. That's that's how our day to day goes by. Got it. And you guys are a twenty four seven operation, right? Yes. So somebody's always here. Yes. <laughs> Got you. And how often are you here? Every day. Every day. I, I try to um on Saturdays or Sundays, um work from home or see what can be done, but uh, there's some weeks where I'm here every day. Got from six thirty to eight p.m. Got it. You still playing soccer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. On Sundays, I'm, you get out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'll get out a little bit. My back sometimes hurts, but yeah. we gotta go. We gotta keep right, going. Right, right. Yeah. Gotta gotta keep it going. Especially you, young man. You don't yeah. want to start freezing up your bones already. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, if 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 I'm in the warehouse with the guys, if we need an extra hand, I'll be the first one to jump right in there. I mean, I saw that earlier when we were moving the forklifts around. He's like, "Nah, I got it. I'll take care of it. Yeah. You don't mind jumping yeah. on that forklift?" No, no, no. Nah, for sure. That's dope, man. That's dope. All right, cool. So as we as we kind of bring the interview to a wrap, um, though, two things we always do is number one, we got to let people know where they can connect with you, um, where they can reach out to you directly and learn more about what you're doing and learn more about Rapid. And then lastly, we always give like a final thought, which is something entrepreneurial, something spiritual, whatever you want to leave the audience with. Um, so I think we can start with uh, the the where people connect with you. So where can people, where, where's the best place to to reach out to you? Best place is email at agomez at rapidships.com or LinkedIn. 
or coming on my website. Okay. And what's the website? Uh, Rapidships.com. Rapidships.com. Okay, got you. And for the final thought, what would you want to leave, uh, leave the audience with for the people who's watching? You have to work hard every single day. Be consistent. Be disciplined. But the most important thing is to believe in yourself. That's the number one thing. If you don't believe in yourself, you already lost the battle. But if you believe in yourself, you're more than halfway there. Mm, mm. I love that. If you don't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. Hustle fam. You know what we do around this time, man? If you smell something burning, it's only a desire, man. This has been a great interview. I learned a lot. Um, amazing business you've built here. I, I know sky is the limit uh, because, man, you're just getting started, bro. Oh, man. Thank you, Rocky. <laughs> you, you are just getting started, man. So I, I want to circle back in a couple years, and I can't imagine where you'll be at that point, oh, man. man. So thank you so much for joining us today, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It was, it was an honor to have you guys here, and, man, I'm so blessed. For sure. Let's do it. Hustle fam, we out. Anthony Gomez, Rapid Ship. We gone. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.